two. We are live. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Mr. Bram Frank, how are you doing today? Very good, Mr. Michael. You know, I you know, I told I told you when I was just sending out those Instagram stuff, when you pop right back, Bram, how are you? I'm like, I know this guy. Because I didn't place it. And then I had to go look up on your site and said, Michael Johnson. I'm going, I know that name. And then as soon as I saw your face, I called Trace and went, I know him. I know him. And that's why I said, I'm so old. I just blanked it. You know, it's it's funny because I think, you know, in this industry, there's one thing that everybody shares and it's getting hit in the head a lot. Yeah. You know, which starts to affect your memory. So <laughs> I'm going to try and get some of these pictures that you sent me. Um, on our on our, our screen so people can see them but let's start with your name ram frank a lot of people call you brahm right and that's not accurate so let's talk about the origin of your name and where it came from because i always feel that people's names motivate them to be who they are in life right well believe it or not when you turn my name in the kanji into japanese because i was adopted by a friend's japanese family believe it or not bram means way of the enlightened warrior Awesome. And, like, and that had no bearing on your life at all to pursue a path in martial arts. No, right? I found, yeah, I found that I was an adult, but my great grandfather uh, was Bram Frank and he was a rabbi. And what, and I always tell when I was growing up, you know, cause I'm in my sixties, people used to go, did you know your name is um, short for Abraham? And I go, well, actually it's not. Did you know Abraham is long for Bram? Because in Hebrew, you know, there's no B, so it's Vram. So Vram means one with God. And then he becomes Abraham, which is the father of all. And then he becomes Abraham, Avraham, the father of the nation. And, you know, when my mom called me Bram, everybody in the family, just no problem. She named my sister Baron, like in a, a, a bastardization of Beryl. And they're like, what's that? And my mother, as I grew up, because she didn't know her grandfather, you know, my great grandfather. So she just went, oh, you know, I got this from Hans Brinker in the Silver Skates. And I'm like, what? She goes, oh, yeah, I had a friend in college. It's a Dutch name. And I'm like, Ma, why would you have a friend from college and just pick this weird name and give it to me? So I still didn't know what my great grandfather's name was. And my grandma told me about it. Um, and. I'm listening. I said, Ma, is it possible when you were growing up, you heard grandma and grandpa, your parents talking about their father, Bram? And as a kid, that name stuck with you. So when I was born, you went, oh, Bram, which is why in a good Jewish family, you named me after, because not, not, you're not supposed to name after your father, but after your grandparents is okay. I'm named after my great grandfather, her grandfather. And people right. go, and, so, and she goes, I never thought of that. She, she goes, my great grandfather's name was Bram, and I had to pull out all the old pictures from Grandma and everything. And have Grandma go, "Yes, your grandfather's name is Bram. That's why we're so excited when you named him Bram." Anyways, means one with God. My I used to joke when growing up, Michael, that my mother knew I was a four-letter word, and that's why I'm Bram. <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump into why we have you on the show today, and you have been in the martial arts a long time. You have a really good. Uh, onslaught of individuals that you've worked with, um, both special forces, law enforcement, military, et cetera. Um, you were kind enough to send me some of your your folding blades that I think are, um, you know, something that's very unique. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me how you got involved in the martial arts. What the martial arts? As I, okay, let's restart that. I accidentally took you out of the stream. Sorry. <laughs> So okay. there you go. Well, I'm there. So, Where's you? Is that do, you, do I need you on it's, there? It's all you right now. Okay. So um, I got into martial arts because my parents, who um, are professionals, my dad was the late Robert Gould, the artist illustrator, and he taught art. So all the local artists, I grew up with them. And my mom also was a professional. She was a, a teacher, uh, went on to become a, a counselor you know, a, a doctor of psychology, but she taught at the university. So they're real big with it. And I grew up outside in New England. So we we're always up in Yale, New Haven. And my dad used to restore paintings. And inside some of these, he found, you know, the way they preserved painting was with rice paper, which actually was original Japanese prints of warriors. And one of the professors at Yale, was, I don't remember Ajahn's last name, but he did Fariani, you know, the Indian martial art. Um, 
I was brought up to always hear about samurai, um, about the Shaolin priests, because my dad worked with the people at Yale, did Japanese and Chinese brush painting. So as a kid, I made my own inks, was exposed to all that. And I became a lover of dinosaurs and arms and armor. And I always wanted to be, you know, a, a white knight. So I, I used to go to the Met, or the Peabody. I, my parents took me to New York all the time and I would go there and study arms and armor. I wanted to be an archeologist about arms and armor. I didn't care about modern weapons. I didn't care about postmodern. All I wanted was ancient. And my mom and dad loved ancient societies and so did my grandfather and I just fell into it. And I always wanted to be one of those warriors. And my dad being an artist, when I said I want to do martial arts, my mom was not for it. And uh, one of the kids in the neighborhood, a couple years older than me, uh, Paul Van Stone, was one of that first group in special forces. And he would come home when I was a kid and we'd train on the front lawn. Of course, he was bigger than I was and he beat me up. But Paul fostered that. Perfect. And That's good training. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, back then, um, Alex Sternberg used to go around to all the Jewish community centers uh, with Harry Kurtzman because – they taught combat Shotokan because their idea was it would never happen again. So we were supposed to be the, the anti-fascists, the anti-Nazis being trained again, as my grandparents used to tell me, never happen again. Um, I really wanted to do it. And my mom was determined that it would, you know, they told her to ruin my hands and I'd never be an artist. Because back in those days, you know, everybody did hidden in the darkness where all the karate schools, the guys did Makawara stuff all the time because mostly Japanese karate and had deformed hands, or that was the myth. And I just had to do it. And uh, Ken Zhao and a few others, I actually have, still have the book. It's actually a woven bamboo book of old Shotokan, and I studied it on my own. And I forced my mother to let me go train with Alex Sternberg, who I've become friends with again as an adult. And, you know, from then, um, I kept seeking out places. Um, and I went to the Tiger Crane School in New York. And I was the only round eye in the class. And that was because you guys might know uh, Jerome Mackey, the name. You're old enough. You probably got it. Jerome Mackey used to go from place to place. He would find whoever was a good martial artist in the town. He would teach judo. And he would get whoever else was there, teach whatever they knew, and give them a chance to have a school. Well, Jerome Mackey had come to our town. And they taught, because they'd never seen Chinese arts taught in open. And they taught Hungar. So I went, perfect. So I took Hungar. I didn't care about judo because I wrestled in school and I did some judo. But Hungar was cool. Made, everything fits in with what I did with my dad. You know, the paintings and the Japanese brush painting. And I could be a Shaolin warrior long before Kung Fu was on television. Um, right. So, you know, I start doing Hungar and the instructor gets injured. And they send a new kid in. And this is got Carnaby Street days. So this comes in with a bowl haircut. And he's got a uh, platform shoes on and he has total disdain for Hungar. He's just looking and I'm like the senior in the class. And he comes to me in the class, in the locker room and goes, Hey, do you want to learn how to fight? And I'm like, well, what the hell do you think I'm taking this art for? And he goes, <laughs> and the next thing, cause I don't know what he's doing. And he just comes right down the center, beats the snot out of me, traps me up and goes, here's the deal. You'll pay for regular classes and you'll bring me in from New York twice a week and pay me extra. So I want to do it. I have no idea what I'm learning, you know, so I'm doing this. And later on, he goes, you got to have someone else to train with. I said, okay. He goes, take the second guy in class. I remember his name, Bobby Terenzio. I can almost picture what it looks like. He goes, you go in there. I go, Bobby, you want to learn how to fight? And he goes, well, what do you think we do in Hungar class? I said, you start chain punching in the face, right? <laughs> yeah, I said, so go ahead. Stop me. And I did what Steve did to me. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I go right down the center. Everything else, I trap him and I snap. He goes, what's that? And I go, I don't know. We're not supposed to talk about it, but I got to have a training partner. And of course, Steve is a smart New York Chinese kid because Bobby's got to pay him a full fee while I pay him a full fee, plus our normal stuff that we're not allowed to talk about. So this whole time we're doing this art. We used to go into Chinatown and it's the first time I had dim sum as a kid. Um, you know, I took the train, $3 round trip back then, Grand Central Station between Connecticut and Grand Central. And we go to Steve's grandma's who spoke no English, and she gave us bags. And I said, wow, they eat donuts. Of course, these donuts were, were dim sum filled with eggs and, and ham or whatever. And we'd go see the original Shaw Brothers movies. And in those days, in Chinatown, for the Chinese, 
Everybody comes on the screen. They act out whatever is the long form of the art they do, and then the movie starts. That's been cut out of all the Shaw Brother movies now. They go right to the movie. Right. But I thought that was so cool. And, of course, I'm the only round eye in the theater. I don't speak Chinese of any kind. And I sat there with Steve, and I'm learning to eat dim sum. And then we go to the Tiger Crane School. And, of course, Steve would proceed to beat the snot out of me. So roll all the way ahead to Enter the Dragon. So I pulled it with Bobby to watch the movie. He turns on, and we both go, hey. We do that, and it took us a while to realize he was teaching us Hong Kong Wing Chun and variations of it. And that's always been more than Shotokan, more than I trained with uh, Che Ri, Jun Ri's cousin for a long time. Wing Chun became a core of what I do in, in my motions, which is why my knives work that way. So tell me about the knives. How did this come about? Um, you sent me some of these. Uh, I just saw them yesterday. Thank you very much. And and you know how I am. I'm a pretty transparent guy. I'm going to ask you some direct questions. That's what I love about you is that you're not like insulted. How dare anybody ask you any challenging questions about your knives? I think that's what makes you effective in what you do. And I have some concerns um, about these. And we, of course, for our fixed blades, we use SH9 Edgeworks. That's Shane Hyatt. He's awesome. But for our folders, you said, Michael, have you thought of using somebody else for your folders? And we started looking at these and I said, okay, well, here's some concerns that I have. And, and I started bringing them up to you on the phone and you were very genuine and transparent in, in saying, here's my concern, right? So you got into knives and our show's only so long. And I know that you're a story guy, like we can say something and you'll run with it, right? Of so of course, and, I'll keep it short. I'll just get right to the point. I promise. <laughs> in 60 yeah. seconds. Tell me how you got into knives and then let's talk about these knives. Okay. I think my cool. grandpa. You know, my dad, I told you, was the late Robert Poole. No artist would be without a knife. My grandfathers gave me my first knives when I was four years old, each of them, because they're from Russia. Right. So they gave me knives and went, you will always carry this pocket knife. They told me how to cut, you know, because without a lock, you got to cut straight in or the damn thing folds and cut your fingers off. Right. There were no locks back then. And uh, so I'm you trying to use these knives, and they told me keep them sharp, keep them clean and uh keep them oiled and you'll give them to your grandchildren so i come obviously you people already got who are listening that i come from a jewish family so i was with my grandfather doing some of the rounds on his business we went to a pawn shop and there's a black cat um you know an old ss knife and it's got a lock so right. i really want of course i'm not allowed to have anything german back then so <laughs> i had a senior friend of mine an older guy go in and buy it for me and bring it back so that I could have this knife with a lock and it was really flat and they still make them exactly the same as it did. And that knife set the tone for me because I went, I'll never have a knife without a lock again. But the lock is not really strong, which is why I patented my own lock. And I, you know, I left one, a lock at Spyroco, but my puzzle lock, I don't know if you, you've, anybody's ever done dovetail joints. Um, dovetail joints are the best way to put wood together. They have to go in and they go back out the way they came in. No glue, no nails, no anything. Real woodworking is done with dovetail joints, and the Japanese are the best. And again, because of my dad and the Japanese brush painting, let me learn about the lock. That's how big buildings are put together. Ancient palaces, they're dovetail joints. Or And my mom used to do jigsaw puzzles. So mm -hmm. once they're in, you could pick up a whole jigsaw puzzle and put them in a frame and keep it. So I decided, and what this is, and you got there, and I can uh, pull it up right here. It's a dovetail joint of steel that goes into the back of the blade. And, uh, you know, you can see that it locks in. And when it pops in, now this only has one half of a piece on it, and you can't break the lock. It's designed for trapping. As Wes tried it, um, it's Marine Corps approved. And, you know, if a, if a jarhead can't break it, nobody can. <laughs> it's a solid piece of steel that becomes one solid piece making it like a fixed blade. So that was important to me that I could trap and the lock release on the back um, because knives are part of my whole family. You know, I, I always carry a knife. You know, it's my American Express card. I'd never leave home without it. So I've had a knife with me literally since I've been four. Um, you, were, you and I talked on the phone briefly about where the lock location was. I went through a lot because I used to be a PA and surgeon uh, for uh, Dr. Rankin. Um, I've been a paramedic as part of my art thing. I have to know, you know, human anatomy and ergonomics important. So this is a shooter's piece and you hold it just like a firearm. So where the lock release is, 
I can push down on it all I want, and it's not going to release. You actually have to push it out, and that's a very hard motion. I People go, I can't make your lock release. I went, I don't want you to open it easily. But once you get used to the flow of it, you can shut it down in the flow and pop it back up because Ernie has a wave out of your pocket. I own kinetic opening, meaning I come up, I hide behind it, I hammer, and if I can touch you like the turnstile, it opens. It's not a raking. It's not a dragging. If I can touch it, it'll open. I got that, Michael. I'm, you're going to laugh because my grandfather's play cards with the guys down in the subway and to keep me occupied, they give me a bag of tokens. They're like half a penny a piece. And I'd put it into the, the turnstile. You push it slowly and it's stored energy. And it goes, wham. And if you push it fast, it goes, really wham. It hit me in the butt. And I went, what a cool idea. And I kept thinking, what if I could take that? Like Buckminster Fuller, you take something from one place, move it somewhere else, synergism, and make it work. So that's a turnstile. Mm -hmm. So I come up. If I can touch you, it's open. And the reason lock release in the back is because it's like a mag release or a decock on a knife. I hold that position all the time. With my finger in the trigger, if I release it, it's in my line of vision. It's in battery. When it's out of battery, it's got a nib that catches my finger. I can bring it back to position of battery or... I can close it and go right back to hammering. Um, I own the patent on indexing, which you can see on this. It's actually post in a hole. And I own a patent on the world's first clip that's flat, a spoon clip with a function. And that's so that you can go to forward or reverse grip without taking your hands off of it. And when the blade's out, you can go forward to reverse grip and jam on it. And when you reverse, if you just push on the indexing, it comes right back to forward and you get used to opening and closing this in the flow so that I can escalate and de-escalate in the force continuum. So here's, here's, and I, and I told you this, here's where my concerns are, right? And right. I understand the reason that you set them up, but I want to bring them up because I think other people have the same questions and I think you answered it, you know, the, with, with some intelligence. And I think that that's important. So the first part of knocking on people, I like that concept. I have a couple of concerns of like once you pull out a knife and they see it's in your hand, we're we're oh, they won't see it. Oh, you got, no one sees you pulling out a knife. Do you ever see um surviving edge weapons? I don't mean to interrupt, but I know you you probably Ralph Rose's original movie had Guru Dan in it, Leo Gahe. Right, right, right. In the interview at the end, a couple hundred officers, and it's maintained it. By the way, I'm a subject matter expert for the state of Washington, state of Florida, in knife murders and knife attacks. So I have to talk to the police and witnesses all the time and do studies. No one sees the knife. We have officers who were trained to see the knife. They never saw the knife. And everyone goes, you know what happens when they see it? Nobody sees it. No one's paying attention to what's coming out. Because anybody who goes, ah, you know what I'm going to do? That's called brandishing. And I'm going to shoot your ass. I'm not going to worry about <laughs> coming with, with the knife because I don't want to get cut. Um, so let's move to the – When it's in their hand – no one's seen it, and I won't directly say on camera, but let's just say I've been in situations where obviously the bad guy, and we're talking about overseas and when I'm working in Israel, uh, in the Middle East, in the Far East, and other places or down in Central America. Let's just say no one has seen it. Um, some of my guys, just a little backtrack, like in, when they were in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were jar their job with the PSD teams was to guard the generals and the dignitaries. Um, when they pulled it out and used it, CNN, to me, the communist news network, came over to go, what was that? And they went, we can't tell you because the, the tool came out, the blade came out, they took care of the bad guy, and then they immediately shut it back down and were back, and they couldn't cap capture what happened. So let's talk about that for a second because I think that's a valid – you know, there was two concerns I had. One was I said, you know, I see this is on the top. I'm concerned that if my hand's here or if my hand's here that I might push that, disengage it. You already addressed that with the channel lock. Okay. Well, yeah, the other lock thing lock. Is, yeah, it's the puzzle lock. The other thing I want you to know is I never put my thumb up there anymore. Mm -hmm. I keep it because, Jesse, I'm sure you've done so. We use that as a grab. I hold it literally only with my bottom three fingers, and I'm sure you see it won't come out of your hand even if it – oops, I'm looking for the camera. Sorry, people. You're good that if it's open, it can't come out, your hand's open, it's a pistol grip. When I lock into a pistol grip, it can't come out, and I never lock my thumb. My thumb's rolling with me just like it's, I'm shooting. My thumb's not on top where the slide would be because I don't do that. So it's down by the side just like I got a pistol grip, and it's never near where that lock is, and that lock actually has to go 
horizontally, perfectly out. And something I told you in phone that I didn't tell the people here, if there's pressure on the blade, the lock can't disengage. Now, before we continue, I want to let everybody know that if you have questions, ask. Um, I can see them pop up, hopefully, on my, on my <laughs> app here. And so we should be able to address these, these questions. The other concern that I had is, and this just comes from you know my own training standpoint, and I have a, a, a difference of opinion on this, but I want you to be able to address it for people to have the same question. Yeah, of course. Once the blade's open, the blade stays open, you finish what you're doing. You're, yeah, you're talking about going between having the blade open, closing that blade. How do you do that in real time without cutting your fingers off? What is what is your um, answer okay, to that? Well, there's a, a, a nib that sticks down. It won't let it. As long as your finger's in the trigger, it can't close. If your finger's in the trigger, the blade cannot close. Okay. Okay. And on the live blades, the nib is actually sharp. So in case you have gloves on or you have adrenaline stress and you're losing fine motor skills and your uh, nerve section is going down or tachypsychia is set in, you know, you have time distortion. This is designed that you can feel it. I don't care if you get bruised. I don't care if it puts a small hole in your finger from the nib. I can either get my hand out of the way, go back to hammering, or I let it come back. Um, the reason I had that de-escalation is I can take this out, I can start to move, and I can do non-lethal in a lethal position. And if I actually get you to respond, I'll de-escalate and wait. If you don't respond and you start to come back at me again, you made your decision. I'm not giving you a second chance. But I'll give you a chance because I can use this tool for trapping, for redirecting, for finger grabs thumb grabs. I use it for cuffing. Like the guys used to, I, I do small circle jujitsu with Wally J for many years. That was our Dumag with Remy. So I have all sorts of finger grabs that I use this for and I teach the police. And I have lots of departments where it's SOP and they use my blue crimp tool because it actually opens and closes very quickly in combat. You don't lose it. As you've seen, I tend to use a lot of my guys, we use it closed. I don't even get it open. I've had officers come to me and security and go, Sir, I hate to say it, I never got the knife open. I beat the snot up. Do you play? Do you like football? I like fighting. <laughs> well, just, I just asked that because some guys know the name Mike Cavelli. He played for the Buffalo Bills. Okay. He didn't play for long. You know, on Buffalo PD for many, many years. Big upper body, gimpy knees that ruined his career. But he was he had my crimped with him. He was doing an undercover thing uh, with some bikers. Came out in the middle of winter, and there's a guy peeing on the side of Mike's truck beer in hand you know one of the last trucks in the and mike walks said you know what the hell this guy just turns right around breaks the bottle and mike didn't grab his firearm he actually grabbed the crimp first and did i mention he used to play middle linebacker and he jam hit the guy's hand and jammed it in the guy's chest caved in the guy's chest he melted right there um mike arrested him called me up and said not a bad tool <laughs> well we tested this yesterday with mr king he does not like your knife. Yeah. Since you tested it with him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I say that jokingly. Yeah, yeah. That striking concept uh, is efficient. I want to jump in because, again, we have limited time. We only have about six minutes left. I want to talk about some of these photos. Oh, Tell you know what? My clock isn't moving. My battery's dead. And I'm like, how is that possible? We use the ball the time. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about this. Who's this gentleman we're looking at right now? Oh, that's uh, Wang. He's one of my guys in China because he translates my drawings into CAD drawings because all of my knives, and good thing you asked, are actually hand cut, hand ground, and hand assembled. We use a wire cutter to make the outside shapes of the same. So if you get one of my knives from the ramp back, everything's identical, as you can see. The only thing I change is the blade shape. So this is an optimum training blade, and they're color-coded like firearms. Red is like a red gun. Blue... Is a working tool like a you know like a, a, a sim gun, and any other color is live. Okay, got it. Great. Th let's take a look at another one. Now, uh, you you work in China, and you speak Chinese, ma? Yeah. Do you speak any Chinese? I don't actually speak Chinese, and I'm just blessed that they speak English. <laughs> um, um, I and uh, you know I've been to the factory a few times, and the factory is very tiny. Uh, it only makes my knives. And like I said, one of the coolest things, because I know lots of custom makers, and I grew up with custom makers and designing for Spyderco in Ontario and Recat and Columbia River and working with a lot of custom guys. And they always wanted to make custom productions. 
So that's what I came up with. None of my knives is that, it's on the randle of the of the knife world for for, for folders. Now you and Ernie have are handmade. You and Ernie have some synergy together, right? Um, and he's he's Absolutely. a really cool really cool guy. If you guys don't know who we're talking about, if you've ever seen the wave on a knife, um, and I think. Kershaw adapted that now, right? Yeah, and Spyderco's got a couple. Um, Fox licensed it because it just like the same thing, you know. Uh, uh, Bastian Bastianelli, Doug Mercaida, um, Maga, Viper, Fox, they all licensed my ramp as well as some other people like Rich Derespina and some of the others. Because I think I told you on phone, Ernie said, Bram, Bram, you got to see this. It opens out of your pocket. I made this little notch because it was an accident when he cut it. And I said, Ernie, you got to see this. Look, look. If you hit it on something, it opens. And our patents are kissing cousins of each other. And his just became his trademark. Um, and Ernie and I have fought together, you know, a, a few times. And he's thinking of licensing my lock, which would be great because he makes hard use tools and he's got that crappy liner lock, you know, needs a, a good lock so he can trap with it. Ernie's a cool guy. I met him at SHOT Show. He custom engraved this knife for me when I was down there. Um, and I was sitting there talking to him. And we're chatting, and he's just a down-to-earth human being. So here's here's my story about Ernie's knife. I'm sitting there with Tony Robbins, right? You, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 absolutely. And we're, I was at a business mastery course with him, and I'm sitting there talking to Tony, and I'm and I'm like, dude, I want to give you a gift that was given to me. And I go to pull the knife out to give it to him because I know he also does martial arts, and the freaking blade catches on my pocket. And opens the blade. So his bodyguards are ready to freaking kill me. Right. right. <laughs> all, my bad. Hold on. Let me close that and give you this gift. And he like, he won't take it. His bodyguard takes it. I said, it's a gift. It opens when, as you can see, when you pull it out of your pocket, it's the only thing that can be detrimental about having the wave well, on your pocket. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, I'm a tip down because when you and I do it right here, see it, it's gross motor skill, right? That I grab it. It comes right into my hand. I come up. And then I'm ready to go. And it doesn't open until I wanted to. Ernie is now. I'm a good Cancerian kid. Mine is when. When do I want it to open? When do I want it to shut? Ernie wanted now. And the two of us used the energy of motion to make it open. We just had a couple different, you know, I just happened to, because I love Seiko. I love limb destructions and good things. This gives me a chance to hammer away. And I'm usually, because I'm, doing security work, some, you're already in conversation space. You're in your face. So I use it to ah, move people away, hit their arm, check in. And if you don't get it, now I use it to redirect you. And if I need to, I can put a cut in there. You've worked with multiple special forces around the globe. Um, now I'm going to say this again. We got like one minute. So, yeah. <laughs> so you got 60 seconds to explain this. So Bram, tell us a little bit about the special forces that you've worked with. Why did you work with them and why do they adopt your blade when it comes to, I mean, they get a lot of options. So why did they adopt your blade? Uh, well, you know, actually, I, have a, I have a very simple training program that goes with it. Um, I use a gross motor skill program and they like the fact that the tool has force options and that they can actually, it's a work tool. They can actually use it to do work. They can use the ramp to pry things open, hammer with it rather than prying with the blade. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that it can go from forward to reverse grip in the middle of flow, that I can pop it open, I can go to, re, you know, and that's what's our indexing. It's going to reverse grip. I can cut. I can come back, come right back to forward grip, and I can use it. And my fixed blades work the same. Tell me the groups that you've worked with. Um, the one, what I can lead. Okay, this is what I say. You tell guys, me what you can tell me. Okay, I, in Israel, you know, I teach the teams in Israel. My family's been there since 1918. I'm just blessed they brought me in to work with different groups there from the Tashial to the Magav to the Yamam and some others plus, you know, the alphabet soup group. Um, I'm the chief instructor for close quarter up at S2, which is a federal and state re research program uh, run by uh, S2 and people like ESI, you know, with Bob Dugan. So I got, I get to meet other agencies who bring me in. Um, I taught PSD. I know I can say that out of McDill for many years for CENTCOM and SOCOM, Central Command and South Command and uh, uh, South Command down here in Miami. Um, I've taught, been a, a full instructor at Fletzi for many years out of Artesian, New Mexico, teaching by BIA. Uh, the Border Patrol was using my tool and my training. And the reason they all take it is they see it, it works under duress. The very thing you're asking, you're worried about under duress. My tools actually work under duress and I teach very simple stuff. 
And that's the important now, testing now, ground. I wanted to bring that up because I think it's easy. There's so many martial artists out there slash individuals that are in the, you know, we, we call it the tactical, right? Like it looks cool, but you have a live background of doing this. You have been doing this a long time. I personally met you. Uh, the second time I met you was 10 years ago, right? Cause my yeah. daughter. Was yeah. Yeah. One into a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. With West. And then I'd met you before that. So I've known you for a while. I got the, the privilege. You reached out to me on Instagram and you're like, Hey, you should check out my knives. And I'm all, I've already checked out your knives, right? I know. <laughs> like that. You call me up Garvey went, this guy knows me. And I had to like go through my head. Yeah. And I, and I sent back a, a, a private message saying, brother, great to hear from you. I hope you're doing well. And then you're like, is this Michael Johnson? Is this like yeah. shockwave yeah. defense Michael Johnson? Yeah. And, and that's why I wanted to put you on, on our Tuesday show here. Cause I just, I, I have a lot of respect for you as a person. I think you're a great human being. Um, and I think that you produce, a really amazing product. And I think it's important for people to be able to check it out. Now we have in closing, um, we have a promo code called shockwave. You use that promo code on Brahm site and see, I did it again. I keep calling you Brahm on Bram site and his site. I'll post in the comment section below this, this link. And for the next 60 minutes, how much are they going to get off of uh, these plates? percent off. 20% off. So you use the shockwave code. And what I like about these is if I'm using this blade, whether I'm doing Piper from Africa or whatever, the, the concepts will still work the same. Absolutely. That it works universally. But here's what I really like about this is, and I feel like I'm doing the home shopping network now. Here's <laughs> what I like is the training tool because yeah. there's too many things where you use a training tool. And we've all seen this, right? Where we get the, the aluminum knives. And one of the first things Nigel did with me in South Africa, which really kind of changed the way that I do knife fighting forever, is he put aluminum. I brought these aluminum knives up and I said, hey, I brought these so we could do our knife training. And he looks at it, he spins it around in his fingers and he's like, that's really nice. And he puts it down <laughs> and he pulls out a kitchen knife and he's all, this is what we're going to be using. And I was like, well, crap. I hope you're good. <laughs> you know? And he said, we'll turn around. And I turn around. He said, tell me when I'm holding the blade to your body and let your friend over here record. I said, okay, cool. Well, I'm standing there and I guess he's holding the blade to me, but I didn't feel anything. And he removes the blade and he sits it down. And then he takes the real knife and he puts it at my back. And there's some kind of frequency. It's the iron in the blood, the magnetism between metal and yeah. aluminum. And yeah. I, I started squirming. I was like, do you have that behind and literally, it was a difference of a millisecond between the time that he put the real blade behind me and the aluminum knife. He goes, that's right. what we train that's with what real blades. Yeah, exactly. that's what we train with real blades. He said, because real the blade. body frequency will change when you train with a fake knife. And if you're going to train as real as you can, and I think it's Tony Blauer that says all training is fake, right? And he's yeah. right. All yeah. training is yeah. fake. Tony, Tony actually asked my knives, uh, Peyton Quinn, Mark McYoung, because um, we're all buddies together. And they went. That won't work. And I said, well, let's try. Do you know Scott Brennan? Do you remember Scott Brennan? I heard Brennan? the name. Scott Brennan is from Teddy Lukai Lukai. And right, Scott, right, right. And he's the old Bally song guy. Well, he was chief of Orca PD, and he came up to Vancouver to one of my seminars because he wrote an article about Bram's a fake guy and all these police officers are falling for him. So he came up with his wife, Leslie, a police officer. To show you I out. What I did with you. I was like, a, you know, hey, come try my stuff. So – at the end of the seminar, he goes, Bram, I have to confide in you. I wrote this really bad article about you saying I was coming up here to prove that this doesn't work. He goes, you got to read the next article. I said, okay. <laughs> he goes, I came up here to prove Bram, these guys are falling for Bram. He goes, they're not falling for Bram. He goes, they're trying to crawl through the floor to get away from the pain. He goes, I never felt that much pain in my whole adult life. And it brought back everything Teddy used to teach us, you know. And, and the Lukai Lukai Arnis that were using yeah. limb instructions, entries, and goes, and damn those, everything I said, you can't grab, small throwback. Give me 10 more seconds. 10 and seconds. We're, all, we're at Soldier Fortune, right? At the, 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 at the Sands in the old days. This giant guy from uh, Las Vegas correction comes over, and my life flashed before my eyes because I barely looked at his solar plexus. I mean, he was big. And he goes, Mr. Frank, that won't work. He goes, I'd never give you my fingers. And he went to hit me, and I hit his hand. And he went, oh, I no, rolled yeah. him in the chest, and he melted in front of me. And his hands are on me. going as he's trying to stop him from falling. He goes, oh, God, Mr. Frank, I just gave you my fingers. I went, yes, you did. Took it it good. Yeah. 
What Are there any questions? Thing, as you know, Michael, nothing works 100% of the time. I just tried to make a good tool. Well, and I think that you have been successful in doing that. And, and you know, from looking at this product, I like it. I think it's cool. I think it's unique. I appreciate you sending me some. Um, I will tell people, you know, like you said, everything works and nothing works. One of my yeah. old instructors, Sensei Brian Schnell, that was his big motto. Great guy. If you ever get a chance to train with him in California, he's phenomenal. Um, Brian, his whole approach, and one of the things that he talked about is you're going to find that everything fails under pressure. Your job is to try and make it work. And that's true. You know, so we're going to put the link to his website in the link below. I had the hardest time trying to promote this event because um, Facebook does not allow promotion of knives or guns. No, and that's what I was trying to tell you on the phone. They shut me down all the time. They have to send me ads and I go, fine. I accept your ad and they go, this violates community standards. <laughs> and I'm like, could you send me the ad? By the way, did the fixed blades get there as well? The fixed blades got here, but we're not, we can't promote your fixed blades. No, no, no. I just want to make sure you got them as a present because I can't tell. They don't let me know. Anyways, well, so they're awesome. They yeah, these are great. Uh, I love the folders. What I and, want you uh, and I think we found a new folder. Yeah, on your own. Match the folder up to the fixed blade. You'll see they're identical except for the blade. I, did. I saw that. It was it was kind of cool. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today. If you guys have questions, tell them how they can find you on Instagram and on the okay, on, the, on, on, on the Instagram. I'm I'm a dinosaur, but I think if you look up Bram Frank, I think I have two counts on Instagram because I never knew I set up another one and made it by mistake. But Bram Frank on the web, you can just Google me on YouTube. Bram Frank, B R A M Frank, F R A N K, or C S S D dash S C dot com, common sense self defense dot com. Okay. It's C S S D dash S C. Okay. Combat, okay. Now and you could have come up, but, and on Facebook, I have a page, um, C S S D modular, um, because I teach modular concepts based on biomechanical shutdown. Like the Black Knight, Monty Python, and the Holy Grail. <laughs> so I'm going to post these up on the Shockwave Defense page for people. I'm going to have Bram send it to me. If you guys have any questions, for the next 60 minutes, you can get 20% off of his knives using the code Shockwave. Apparently, I have a guest. Um, so we're going to end the project. Okay. Bram, thank, thank you so you. much. No, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your commitment that you have made. Uh, to the defense community and to martial arts and just being who you are as a martial artist and a human being. You've done a, a great service to our community. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure having you guys today. I look forward to seeing you soon. Bram, I'll give you a call in about 10 seconds. You God got bless it. Everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll put that code down below. And we'll also make sure that we... Um, yeah, uh, I, actually, I think Mies is going to let it run for a little bit longer in case people have have trouble getting to getting to the. Uh, awesome. All right, right. We go. We'll see you guys soon. God bless you. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye bye.